Well, I've heard enough. I'll just find Krugel and torture him and get him to tell me where the other scum suckers are hiding. I don't care what methods you use, Hammer. Just bring back my daughter. I will, sir. Dead or alive. Don't trust us, we have zero idea of what we're doing. None whatsoever. Do you even remember what a mic looks like, Jerry? Just about. I think it's this large thing pointing at my mouth. But Careful there, this is a family friendly show. It is a family friendly show, that's for sure. There'll be no curse words on here. No shenanigans. None at all. Yeah, just like Sledge. Indeed. So we had episode zero last week, Ian. I hope people listened to that because... It'll save us having to repeat things now. Yeah, in fact, if you haven't listened to it, go and listen to it. It's only a few minutes long. I'll explain what we're doing, why we're doing it. Who we are. In case you can't be bothered, I'm Jerry. I'm Ian. And you may remember us from the Columbo podcast. That finished a, a few months ago. It did, it did. Very enjoyable run from our point of view. It was, I and mean, we may still revisit it in the future, you never know. I've got a few ideas. I think there might be a Columbo episode or two coming out in the next... Uh, yeah, next six months, maybe. To two years. To, yeah, next six months. Yeah, give or take a... a we're, or we're not here to talk about Columbo. We're not. What are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about Sledge Hammer. Yes. You knew practically nothing about this other than what you learned during the Columbo run. I did. I picked up some bits and pieces because, of course, half this cast were in Columbo. Well, certainly a few, yeah. David Rashi was... Uh, can you remember which episode he was in? I remember the episode, I can't remember what it was called. Him and Sheridan Issey mm-hmm. killed her husband. No, they killed, no. They killed uh, someone who was having an argument with the husband. Yes, legal to frame bath. the husband. Yes. That's it. Yes. It's actually quite a, a smart move. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. in the end. No, the episode was called A Trace of Murder. Of course it was. Yeah. Harrison Page, who is also a regular star in this, uh, this show, he was in, can you remember the episode? No. Undercover. Oh, of course, that was no wonder I don't remember that one. What are you talking about? You I loved actually, it. You loved it. You talked me into no shame for that. Uh, n- that, that that's unfair. We won't go over that again. We're not. No. We're not. We're we're working hard not to be sidetracked by Columbo while we record Sledgecast, but we apologise in advance for the many times it's going to happen. Episode one, also known as the pilot, also known as Under the Gun. It is. Before we begin this this episode. Um, what did you know about Sledgehammer? I mean, almost nothing I knew from talking to you about it that it's kind of a, almost a parody, pastiche type show. It ran for a couple of years. Apparently there's a big cliffhanger in between the two seasons or something mm. along those lines, but I haven't got that far. I've only watched episode one. I really don't know much about it beyond that. I don't know what the characters are like, what the plot's like, what the structure's like, anything like that. Okay, that's good. You can learn as you go. People are used to this. I think the uh, the opening credits certainly uh, hint at what's to come. Yeah, we, we see a, a close-up of a gun from a number of angles as it lies on a cushion. Yeah, I've noted here it's soft core feel. Yeah, you can, you can understand. Mm-hmm. I think as it's, the camera is caressing the, the gun as it lies there. I suspect that's quite intentional. Mm-hmm. Fairly, the gun is fairly phallic anyway, isn't it? Yeah. Just like the microphone. Indeed, mm-hmm. but again, family friendly. Hammer, or who we learn is Hammer, lifts the gun at the end of the opening credits. He says his catchphrase, which is, trust me, I know what I'm doing. And then he shoots off to the side of the screen. Yeah. I mean, it's fairly infamous. Uh, he shoots off, I mean, he's meant to be shooting at the camera, but clearly he's aiming off camera. Yeah. And the reason for that was that the, the high hegens at ABC thought that some sensitive souls might get a fright and have a heart attack and their families would sue the network. And the compromise was that he would shoot off camera. Uh, what else is there worth talking about in the credits? The, the score. Yes, it's a, a popular theme tune. You'll notice it doesn't bear too much of a difference from our own. No. But it's definitely not the same tune. No, it's not the same tune. It was inspired by... By our theme tune. By our theme tune, yeah. Or some, one way around, I'm mm-hmm. not sure. Yeah, the theme tune was composed and performed by Danny Elfman. You've heard that name, Ian? I have heard that name. Where have I heard that name? He was born in LA in 1953. He has had four Oscar nominations, three Golden Globe nominations, two Emmys with one win, 
two BAFTAs, 11 Grammys with one win. He composed and performs the theme for The Simpsons. Right, that's Desperate probably Desperate Housewives, Good Will Hunting, Tales from the Crypt, Beetlejuice, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, Batman, the Tim Burton one. So he worked with uh, Tim Burton quite a lot. Decent CV there. Very I think decent. The Simpsons will be the one that I, I remember the name from. Yeah, very talented guy. He's been in the industry for a, a number of years. and In fact, that last song, I think... I'm not sure, but I think he may have been performing uh, in Back to School, the Rodney Dangerfield movie. I think he was in one of the bands uh, in that movie. Anyway, digress. But the theme's good. I think it's uh, it's very apt. I think it captures the, the mood and the feel of the episode. I think it's got the same sort of over-the-top element to it as well as the, the, car- the lead character does. Yeah. We begin... Wait a second, we're breaking from tra- tradition we here. We can't do that. Normally what happens... Well, back on the old show, mm-hmm. back in the day, yeah. we would have a summary at this stage. I would present to the audience a summary of the episode I had watched, mm. and then we would discuss it. I'm very much a traditionalist, Ian, so crack on. In Under the Gun, suspended police officer Sledgehammer is recalled to active duty on the personal request of the mayor. The mayor's daughter has been kidnapped, and Hammer must team up with a new partner and attempt to solve the crime. But all is not as it seems. Thanks for that, Ian. We bit out of practice, but we'll, we'll get better as the series yeah, continues. You'll, you'll get there. I feel your pain, Ian. It's, uh, it's unusual being back here, talking into the microphone. I don't know what to do, what to say, but I think we'll just, you know, suck it and see. Yes, we'll see how we get on. Where do we begin? Night time. We've got a group of armed robbers who shoot a security guard and Approach a woman who's in her bed. This turns out to be the mayor's house. Yes, the next morning's papers show that the mayor's daughter is missing. Or <laughs> just very good at hiding, <laughs> as the news reporter says. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, so we're in the, the mayor's office in the next uh, the next morning. The mayor's there with the chief, the chief of police. Yes. And we see Sledgehammer being interviewed on TV after, I was going to say, preventing a, well, I suppose, yeah, preventing a, a robbery at a, a grocery store? Yeah, my understanding is this wasn't a live report, this is an archived report, and it's the reason that Hammer was suspended, because the chief says, after the grocery store incident, I suspended him. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point, Ian, I've never really thought that much about it, but yeah, it couldn't have been live because he's, yeah, he's on suspension. Yeah, and the gist of the, the report is he's been out doing his shopping, come across an armed robbery and shot the uh, criminal's dead. We hear uh, the mayor, Jack Flambeau. Flambeau. Flambeau, yep. He, I think he sums up the character of Sledgehammer. This Sledgehammer, who is he? A menace. He used to fire warning shots at jaywalkers. Now, after this liquor store incident, I placed him on six months suspension with orders not to leave his apartment. But take him off suspension or put him on this case. But Mr. Mayor, Rumour has it that this man talks to his gun like it was a person. This isn't open for discussion. This is an order. I want Sledgehammer! It's clear from what we hear that the mayor likes the cut of Hammer's jib and wants him on the case. Yeah, well, I'm not sure how much he actually likes the cut of his jib, but how... And in these conditions, he's happy to have someone who isn't going to... He's going to any lengths he will try and get the, the, the daughter back. Yeah. Although we come to... Oh, we heard at the top of the show, actually. We did. That Hammer, his first instinct might not be to bring her back alive. No, but he's, he's put straight. We're introduced officially, I would say, to Sledgehammer then in his flat apartment. Apartment, yeah. What's he doing? He's just shooting at a target on the wall and his neighbours are becoming more and more agitated. And the phone goes and of course he's trying to answer the phone as they're banging on the walls and he is totally oblivious to uh, his actions. Yeah, he doesn't understand that they're banging on the walls because of him. Uh, He gets the call and the call is from the mayor of the mayor's office saying that um, he's back in, you know, he's back in action, back in business, unsuspended. Reinstated. Yes. He tells his gun. He does now... We see him in this episode, this is a character trait that we shall come to discuss further uh, as we progress, uh, but he loves his gun. This is uh, The gun is actually one of the main characters in the show, and he talks to it. He does here. Do you know much about guns, Ian? No. Like pointy things that shoot. That's it. 
Apparently this is a Smith & Wesson 629 Magnum. Is that a classic gun is it used in the movies? I'm not sure. I think it's um, more Austin Kate. I think it's more flamboyant than, you know, it would have to be a Dirty Harry type. Okay. It's not standard issue? No, certainly not standard issue. I think it would be a certain type of movie, a certain type of character who, who would use this type of gun. It's a big gun. It certainly is. Hammer's straight in his car and he's got the music going. Beethoven is fifth is blasting away. So he's going to the precinct, but he is uh, derailed. He literally runs into a roadblock. He does. What's happening? There's a sniper on the roof. And uh, Hammer, looking very Dirty Harry-esque, gets out. Question is the, the uniformed cop. Yep. Finds out the sniper. Finds out the building's been cleared. Mm-hmm. What does he do? Goes back to his car. And from the trunk... Pulls a missile launcher or some kind of a grenade launcher. A rocket launcher. Whatever you want to call it. A launcher of some variety. Yep. Did you see the sticker on the the back of the car? I love violence or <laughs> yeah. I heart violence. Yep. Anyway, he uses this um, mm-hmm. missile rocket grenade launcher to bring down the whole entire building. Yeah, now this is quite interesting because I don't want to give too much away. But I've heard this fact, so it's okay. You sure? I understand I've- this is his only human kill on camera yeah well you don't yeah you don't see it on camera i suppose it's off camera but it's implied obviously that he has certainly killed the man on top of the sniper but you'd think as well that there's probably some i mean it was an uncontrolled explosion Mm -hmm. so you're thinking there's probably some collateral damage in the surrounding vicinity yeah Yeah. collateral damage is the exact phrase that would be used Mm -hmm. we learn from this that he doesn't mess about yeah, an interesting bit here though is he talks to his gun mm-hmm. and denies it when questioned. Well, that's what I said earlier. He, or did I say it? Maybe no, you I'm didn't just... say it, you were maybe thinking it. Ah, maybe I was sidetracked then, yeah. There are a few times in this episode where he talks to his gun and I think it's nicely done because you could easily have the character just talking to his gun and not caring. But he talks to his gun but understands and appreciates that it's an odd thing to do. Yes. And he's, he's embarrassed by it. Absolutely, he is. But he can't help it, because he keeps doing it. Yeah. His amigo. Put it that way if you want. Sledge does. He makes a similar entrance to police department. What, what city are we in? I, I didn't get it's it. It's unnamed. Now, um, obviously we haven't mentioned, but this is a Dirty Harry parody satire. Yeah. And uh, Dirty Harry was set in San Francisco, filmed in San Francisco. This city is never named in the show, but I think it's meant to be San Francisco as well. Okay. See, I always thought, looking back now, let's say I'm not an expert, I always thought it would have been LA. I think it was filmed in LA. Some of the, the outside of the precinct is, I think, an, an LA uh, office building. Right. We can chat more about that in future episodes, I think. Absolutely. Okay, so he gets there. Everyone, even the sort of the criminals and uh, the cops, know what he's like, apart from one unfortunate chap. So he walks in and everyone ducks for cover. Yeah, except the guy at the vending machine. So what's happened? Yeah, it's swallowed his money. Yeah. And how does uh, Hammer obviously deals with it by shooting the vending machine? <laughs> yep, and walks in. And it works. Mm-hmm. Can't really complain. Nope. We go into the uh, the main, uh, behind the, the, the back office, as it Yeah, were. and the captain summons yep. Hammer to his office. Hammer! In my office right now! And this plays on the, the stereotype, the, the, the trope of 80s police captains and, and, and uh, senior figures, they were always shouting, you know, I think Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, there was always a captain who would, you know, be under stress, under pressure, probably an alcoholic. They sat in the office and the uh, the maverick underling yeah. would always put him under a bit of pressure. So in the office, what happens? Well, captain wants to know what's going on about, first of all, shooting indoors and then yeah. about blowing up a building. And he tells him to take his glasses off. Mm-hmm. I think he then gives him a, a massage, you're looking a bit tense. Well, he gives him a bit of a chiropractic adjustment, as he calls it, uh, cracks the captain's neck, um, makes the point that the only way to, to fight criminals is to be wilder than they are. Which is not textbook. It's not textbook, no. I mean, it seems to get results. So far, so good. Uh, yeah, so what's, what has he told? He's back on the... Uh, he's been personally selected. By the mayor for this particular job. Mm-hmm. And obviously the, the captain is not hiding the fact that he's not happy about it. No. So we head over to the mayor's office and we've got Hammer, Trunk... Did we say that? That's Captain Trunk. Oh, you didn't say Trunk, you said the captain, or I said the captain. Yeah, Captain Trunk. Okay. The police chief are with the mayor in, in the office. Yeah. We're introduced to... A terrorist psychologist. Yep. Detective Dory Darrow. Dory Darrow. 
It's immediately obvious that when she enters, Hammer is unimpressed by her gender. He makes an immediate sexist comment and seems to be offended with the idea he would have to partner with a woman. There's one interesting thing here. Um, when she's setting up a presentation, all three of the guys sort of have a check her out. They, they bend over and have a look at her, her uh, posterior. Inappropriate. Yes, but this is the only time, I might be wrong, but looking back now, this is ne- never happens again. You know, Hammer is not interested in women in that way anymore. And the other guys, it's just not something. It's not a... Whilst he is uh, sexist, obviously, and his, his views are very questionable, um, he doesn't ever uh, try things on. He's not a he's not a ladies' man. He's not that type of, of, of guy. He's not a... Predator. Predator. I've got to say creepy Lothario, but a predator, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think they obviously they, they looked at this and thought, no, that's not a character trait, because... I think you want him to be quite lovable, actually. And if he was a bit pervy, then it's harder to make that funny. You make the connection as well with the audience, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, the, the comic book violence is fine, but comic book uh, creepiness isn't. No. So I think they were quite right in reining that back. Yeah. I did enjoy, during the, the presentation, the, the logo that the, the evil organisation had. What was that? Just basically a pin through a sad emoji. Yeah. In a pre-emoji time. Yep. We find out there's this... Uh, this, this Terrorist organisation Avon. What was that again? Avon was Avon the... lady came to your door and sold you uh, no, cosmetics. Yeah, I know. I know what that that's is. That's what mean, it was. What does? What does? What's the? Oh, well, in this, I yeah. have no idea. I didn't write it down. Yeah, that's the thing about unlike with Colombo, you know, the actual plot. The details don't matter. The details don't matter that much. But there's this this, this gang apparently is behind yeah. the uh, the, the kidnapping. This is where we got the we had the clip in the the introduction about uh, bringing her back dead or alive. The mayor's not happy with that idea. No. As I mentioned, Sledge is uh, is aghast at the uh, thought of having to partner with a woman, but he obviously reluctantly agrees. Yeah, he gets out to the car and he makes his position clear. He's the guy. Mm -hmm. He calls the shots and he fires the shot. I mean, I think we can immediately see that Dore de Roe is she's not going to, you know, she's not going to just take his nonsense. Yeah, she's she pushes back immediately. Absolutely, she does. She gives him a piece of her mind. As she's doing that, what happens? Uh, A man steals a handbag, sort of a a A purse snatcher. snatcher, yeah. Yeah. And Sledge leans over Dory to open her car door to upend the man. Mm -hmm. He gives back the the, the bag to the old lady, grabs a hold of this this snatcher. Yeah, he's he's about to perpetrate violence upon him. Yep. The role points out they're outside the town hall or city hall, and Sledge has a unique method of enforcing retribution. Yeah, well, he takes uh, Dory's advice not to brutalise the man. Mm. So he makes the man brutalise himself. How does he do that? He gets him to punch himself in the face and the gut and then finish himself off. Yeah, but he, he smashes his own head, he grabs his own hair and smashes it into the, the roof of the car. Yeah. It's quite funny. I'm not sure, however, of that would, you know, pointing a gun at someone and saying, okay, I'm not going, if I had to say I'm going to stab you and then I'd say that I better not stab you, I'll point a gun at you and tell you to stab yourself. I'm I not think sure. it would still count, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think that probably still counts as uh, police violence. Anyway, mm-hmm. they're off looking for Krugel, who is the, the bad guy. Yeah, where did we get this name from? Oh, Krugel, that was part of the presentation, pre- yeah. presentation, yeah. And it's night time. It is. We, we see some of the, well, well, we're the seediest th- joints in town. Yeah, so it flashes up these neon lights, you know, of sex show and X-rated videos, etc. And what else flashes up? The uh, GOPHQ, the Republican Party headquarters locally. Yeah. So I think that, you know, this showing that it's more than just a... Obviously, forerunners to this show would be things like Naked Gun, etc. Yeah. But they were played more for... It was more slapstick. It was for laugh. There was no real message. message. Yeah. But I think, um, and we will discuss the, the creator and the writer of this episode in, 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 in future. Um, might even tweet him. We might even tweet him, yeah. I think let's get a couple of episodes in the go. Let's get... Shh, don't tell him don't, yet. Yeah, don't tell him yet. And then see if everyone likes it. Then we can all barrage him with uh, tweets saying, oh, you need to come on the show and things like that. Don't barrage him. No, don't. Don't anyway. No, just give him a little... Uh, poke on Facebook or something. I don't know what you're doing. Can you still poke on Facebook? I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Give him a face on poke book. Mm-hmm. Could do. So yeah, I think this shows the the more subversive nature of the show. It, it does have something to say. Yeah. And I, again, we can. this is a, a chat we can have in the future, but you, know, you need to think about the time. This is the mid-80s. So We've you've got, got, got early riots. And early so riots. You know, you've got Reagan in power. We need to think of it, I suppose, in the social context of what's going on and why this, you know... It's not hugely dissimilar to what we're seeing now. No, you may actually say that it's, the environment back then was less... Toxic. Toxic, yeah. 
I mean, I think, in, in all fairness, we're, you know, we're laughing there about police uh, violence, but... <laughs> it's not a laughing matter. It's not a laughing matter, no, in, you know, in real life. But the, the point is, if this was just laughing at it, it would be uncomfortable, but... You know, th- it's making the point. It's making the point, yes. We're not, this guy uh, is meant to be to be laughed at for what he's doing. And I think you know, Dory is the voice of reason generally. Yeah, and the guy's held out as absurd. Yes. Which is fair enough, but could potentially detract from the idea that there are policemen out there who are dangerous. Oh yeah, I mean, we're meant to laugh at him. And, and we're meant to think that his views and his actions are utterly repugnant if, you know, if it was in real life. But yeah, I think it is making the point that there are people with very similar views. They find Krugel at a, a massage parlour. Well, no, it's not It's not a massage parlour. Well, he's getting a massage. Yeah, I think he's just invited these uh, masseuses to his motel room. Okay. And there's a funny bit here where I think Sledge tells him to, to scram and they claim that they don't speak English, so Sledge speaks to them in Swedish. <laughs> what happens? Uh, they get into a bit of a a rumble and Dory ends up saving the day. Well, how they get into rumble because uh, Slash tells him to get up. He says, oh, I'm awful shy. Can you turn your back whilst I get changed? <laughs> Sledge, being a little bit stupid, does. And he pulls out a gun. Yeah. But Sledge disarms him by dropping his own gun when requested, but still managing to shoot the gun out of Krugel's hand. Yeah, very clever. Very clever. Hearing this shot, Dory bursts in. Yep, yeah, and she fights well. Well, well, okay. Who does she fight? Can't remember. Can't remember. I'll tell you who she fights. Some guy f- comes in at the back of her. Right. She immediately beats him up. Oh, it's the manager. Yeah. Who Sledge knows. Yes, yeah, so we find out it's the manager, <laughs> but this uh, is, is a friend, actually. He says he's a friend of mine. Yeah. Sledge, however, is very impressed. Duro, that was excessively violent and completely unnecessary. I loved it. It was poetry in motion. Thank you. I was top of my class in hand to hand combat. I'd like to fight you sometime, bro. You're on. They head back to the police station and... Well, before, listen, before we go there, I think it is worth noting, so, throughout the uh, arc, even just of this episode, you know, you see the two of them are polar opposites, they don't like each other. Um, but this is one of the first times that you can see the ice melting here. He now respects her. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can see this bond forming, which, you know, is important going forward. Definitely. Back at the police station, they yep. are interviewing or interrogating perhaps uh, Krugel. Who's still sitting in his towel. Yep. He asks for a coffee. Mm-hmm. And Sledge gives him a coffee. Sledge essentially tortures him there. Boiling water over the genitals. That's it. <laughs> and he insists that his rights be respected, but Sledge only respects the rights of American citizens. citizens. <laughs> yeah. Can you point, Krugel points out, I'm an American citizen. He's like, oh, okay. Uh, well, anyway. He's not going to talk, and Sledge tells him he'll be taking him to the circus. And he literally takes him to a spinning wheel with balloons, and he starts taking pot shots, terrifying Krugel into revealing a name. And then shoots the balloon above his head. Yep. Claiming that he missed <laughs> what he was aiming for. So Krugel has given up some information on an inside man, apparently, or an inside person, certainly mm. close mm-hmm. to the mayor who's involved. And we're sitting at Sledge's and Dory's desk. Yeah, in the sort of communal area Mm -hmm. of the police station. And Hammer points out that he hates computers because that's how he met his ex-wife. Yes, and again, you know, this is a these are the little scenes I think that make this stand out from other slapstick shows. So we actually find this is quite a nice scene. We find out a little bit about Hammer. So he met his ex-wife. I'm not quite clear how he met his ex-wife because this is the days before internet dating. It's not internet dating; it's computer dating. So how did that work? He would use an agency where you would get into the agency. And they would use the computer to pair you. They would take your details, put it on a base like a card, someone else would come in and then you would pull out, you'd print off this data and go, ah, here, here's a match. You obviously remember better than me, because I never had that experience. No, that's, yeah, possibly. So, yes, he met his ex-wife through computer dating, but she ran off with, well, this was three years ago, she ran off with a member of the Peace Corps. Yes. And then there's a nice little scene, a nice little bit here, he, he opens up, to Dory. Yeah, he explains how the other cops are all wusses except for him. Don't wa- they all want to get results, but they're not willing to do what it takes. And he says, you know, I can't, I can't let my guard down for a moment. And Dory's watching this, and she says, well, you just did. And he realises he did. And I think this is why this show is such a great show. Yeah. There are touches here of... Little character moments. Little character moments, yeah. It's not just him shooting guns and, you know, of course, most of it is, of course, but it, it, you know, it builds upon this. The captain comes up. 
he's not happy because Krugel's complained about the, the copy thing mm-hmm. and the balloon thing. But Dory defends Hammer. The next, so we had that scene there where Dory appreciates Hammer opening up. She then defends him because, you know, she's a professional and they're partners, so you stand by your partner. Yeah. Now, Hammer had also suggested just before the, the trunk, Captain Trunk come up that the mayor's wife was involved. Yeah. Dory said, I don't think so, and she pulls up the computer and shows that she's a big donator to charity, she's an upstanding member of society, and she shows all these charities that she's involved yeah. in. But she says even though she disagrees, she's going to mm-hmm. work with Hammer and support him. Yep. Hammer doesn't buy it because he says that uh, his uh, personal favourite charity is missing. Can you remember what it was? No, is it the NRA? Nope. Almost <laughs> worse than that. Toy guns for tots. <laughs> right. I do remember. Yeah. Now, after this, again, we see the relationship uh, forming uh, even more because she walks away after saying she'll back him up and he pulls out his gun. What does he say? I can't remember what he says. I like her. Right. And you, you, you just hear a voice off off, uh, off camera saying, who are, you, who are you talking to? Are you talking to your gun? And he's <laughs> like, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> he puts that away. They head over to the, the mayor's office and they've got his wife all sort of trussed up and gagged. I hate to say it, sir, but your wife is a lying, scheming, deceitful, no good piece of white trash. Oh, I've known that for years. But she had nothing to do with the kidnapping. Chief! Put this numbskull back on suspension for the rest of his life. No way, I don't understand. I've just had a call from the kidnappers. Aha. Uh-huh. They've given me a drop-off location and a demand for a private jet. Aha. Uh-huh. I have no course now but to capitulate, mm. thanks to you. So Hammer's suspended again and the mayor's going to have to pay this ransom and Dory's got the job. And again, we see just a couple of bits here. Hammer says, you know, whoever's going to be sent to this drop-off is it's a suicide mission. He says, I'll do it. Yeah, he's trying to save her. And even when that's uh, ruled out, she's walking away and, or he's walking out, he tells her to be careful. Yeah, he helps getting fond of her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, earlier on, actually, we didn't mention, in the main office scene, when they're at the computer, as Trunk walks away with his neck in a brace, <laughs> I think Sledge throws a paper plane in his hair. His hair yeah. And we see it in this scene where he walks out, the paper plane's still stuck in his, in his hair. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So now that I said, this, it's a warehouse, isn't it? A drop off, yeah. sort of stereotypical uh, rundown, uh, abandoned warehouse or something like that. It's a, a fellow in a fluorescent balaclava there of, I think, Eastern European extract. Who knows, yeah. The gangs, yeah, they reveal themselves along with uh, the daughter, Fran- mm. Francine. Well, it turns out that she's part of the plan, but Dory already knew that. Well, we find out that Dory knows that now, yes. Yeah, she's looking at finance, she tracked down that they were together at uh, college or university, and. The, what happens? The the daughter grabs a gun and points it at Doro. But Hammer hasn't followed instructions. No, he bursts in through a, a window in the in the roof. Very Batman esque. Very. Thought. There's a bit of banter, and then we get a very what comic style. It's stylized fight scene. Fight scene. He throws a grenade that traps some bad guys under the boxes yeah. that were next to him. He himself gets shot. Not I mean not physical, not personal. His jacket, but his jacket shot, gets yeah. shot, and that really annoys him because he likes that jacket. He loves a. A sports jacket, as they call yeah. it in the States. It comes to the final showdown, Francine has Dory, who seems unable to fight her way out of that, mm-hmm. and Hammer squares off and shoots the gun out of Francine's hand in the same way they did with yeah. Kruger earlier. Yeah, well she says, yeah, you wouldn't shoot a woman, would you? I don't believe you will, and he does, but he doesn't shoot her, but he shoots the gun. Yeah. See, that's the thing, again, we don't want to look too deep into this, but he's good enough to shoot a gun by dropping his own gun and shoot another gun out of someone's hand, but in a fight scene like this, he never actually shoots anyone. He just sort of randomly fires bullets. Yeah. So the story's pretty much wrapped up at this point. They head back to the mayor's office. And Dory's going to get promoted for her hard work. She is. However, we find out that Hammer is still on suspension. That's not been revoked. Yeah, and they've prepared a speech for her to read where she credits the right people in the right way. Well, the mayor wrote it himself and it's to credit him, really. Essentially. And what happens? She's very unhappy that Hammer's been overlooked and declines the promotion. Thank you, sir. I respectfully decline the promotion. What? Am I hearing correctly? Seems like you're hearing pretty well. Let's go, partner. Daru, you're off your rocker. True. But I know what I'm doing. (laughs) 
It's a nice ending. They leave together. Yep, sunglasses on. Stylish. Yep, the team is. Uh, that, that's the team in action. That's the team been formed. The bond is there. That's us going forward from now. So this is remember this is the pilot episode. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good pilot in the sense that it establishes all the characters, it establishes their characteristics. Yeah. Leaves us in no doubt what the, the tone of the show, what it's trying to say. Yeah. I mean, it walks a bit of a tightrope at times between um, humour and just nonsense. But it's, it's a tr- tricky balance and I think there's sort of a strike rate. If you get enough of them right, then you can forgive the ones that don't quite hit. Oh yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they come so fast and thick that if you don't like one, don't worry, the next one will be along and you'll, you'll yeah. forget all about it. Um, I mean, that's the thing, we're not going to have the chance to quote all the, the funny lines in here because they're basically every line is a... And it would ruin it if we tried to deliver it. No, not going to do that. Yeah. Um, I'll pick out a few, mind you, maybe in per episode, I think. Maybe we can do that. Pick out yeah. a, a few personal favourites. I mean, I did like the one at the top of the show there about uh, I'll bring her back, uh, dead or alive. My favourite one was the uh, whether what you did in the grocery store was truly necessary. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What, the, the hot dog weenies, wasn't he it? Says, yes, I had no supplies at all. <laughs> so, that's the first episode over. What do you think? I enjoyed it. Is there any exciting trivia? Of course I have. Hey! Well, I don't know about exciting, but I've got some trivia. I like this. Yeah. So, production information. So, we, we always did, did this with the uh, the Columbo podcast. And then what we would do as well is we would, um, at the end of each season, we would decide whether or not the guilty party would be found guilty in court. I don't think we can do that. In it's slightly. not the same <laughs> idea, no. no. So, production information. The first episode, 23rd of September 1986, was its original air date on the ABC network. This was written by the creator, Alan Spencer. A bit of a, a boy genius. So we'll discuss Alan. In due course. In due course. Martha Coolidge was a director. She was born in 1946 and uh, has directed films such as Valley Girl. Real genius. That's a personal favourite of mine. I think I mentioned that before. I'm sure. I'm trying to think when we would have mentioned that in Columbo. Mm, but anyway, real genius. Val Kilmer. Good movie. Rambling Rose with Laura Dern. A lot of CSI episodes and some Sex in the City episodes as well. It's a contrast. Yeah. Well, I do remember the one when Sex in the City when they tried to track down the drug dealer. Oh, I'm making that up, it's not. Ah, okay. I've not watched any of it. Sounds plausible to if me. If we could have a crossover, Sex in the City and CSI crossover, I think we should petition for that. Okay. So the stars are obviously David Rashi playing Inspector Sledgehammer. We shall not discuss him in too much detail just now. Due course, we're, we're saving it for a dull yeah. episode. Anne Marie Martin played uh, plays Detective Dory DeRoe, and Harrison Page, as discussed, played Captain Trunk. So yeah, we'll chat about them in, in the coming weeks. Guest stars: John Vernon. Now, did you recognise the the mayor? He seemed familiar. Yeah, he's a prolific character actor. Died in two thousand and five, aged seventy two. Latterly done a lot of voiceover work for uh, for video games and uh, cartoons, Batman, Incredible Hulk, etc. He tends to play authority figures, you know, like okay. head teachers, deans, uh, mayors, cop, that type of stuff. So he, uh, most famously known, I suppose, for Animal House, Delta House, which is a TV spin-off of Animal House, Mission Impossible, Outlaw Josie Wales. But probably the reason why he was asked to play this part was that he played the mayor in Dirty Harry. That makes sense. Yeah, so he's, he's basically a homage to, to, to that. To his own character. character. Yeah, which I thought was nice. Yeah. Judy Aronson played uh, Francine, the daughter. Okay, born not in really 19- in it very much. You no, know, the reason I mentioned I've been a little bit self-indulgent, she was born in 1964, she has been in some of my favourite movies, uh, Weird Signs, Friday the 13th, the final chapter, very good one, that's part four. And she was also in um, American Ninja, which I watched on Netflix the other week. <laughs> So she's quite famous in terms of sort of Friday the 13th lore. She um, currently owns Rocket Body Pilates. Would you want your body to look like a rocket? Kurt Krugel was played by Don Stark, born in 1954. This is his first of two episodes playing Kurt Krugel. Okay. He has recently been in Marin, the Mark Marin mm-hmm. show, playing Jerry. He played you? Mm hmm. Yep. And he was in 198 episodes of That 70s Show. Not seen that one. Me neither. I think it's quite popular. Must be if it ran for 198 episodes. A couple episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm, Murder One, Star Trek First Contact and Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I wonder if there's going to be a big Star Trek again connection with with, uh, Sledgehammer. That'd be interesting, wouldn't Uh, it? I'll keep an eye on it. That's all I have. Well, 
It's a good start. A reasonable start, I think. Uh, like I say, what we'll do is we'll, we'll chat more about the origins and the the creators and the stars. Uh, the, the, a slow the, week. Yeah, and a slow <laughs> week. Now we'll, we'll, we'll drop it in. This week's episode, actually, this is probably going to be on the long end. I mean, people who are used to the Colombo podcast have been getting 90-minute shows from us. I think if we hit 45 minutes in one of these, that's going to be your, your lot. Yeah, we'll try and keep it, I think, to sort of 30 to 40 minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes, we'll, we'll aim for that, but who knows? Who knows, indeed. We have a lot of fun. Once we start chatting, talking rubbish, it's hard to... There's uh, no reason to stop. There's no reason... Well, there is. I'm absolutely starving. I'm not my dinner yet. Yeah. So we'll be heading, grab something to eat. I think that's a good plan. And we'll see okay. folks next week. Well, tell people, how do they get, how do they get in touch with yeah. us, of course. Sledgehammer. And, and, and ask them as well, ask them for a weird review or rating, that would be really cool. Oh yeah, okay, I'll do that. Uh, sledgehammerpodcast.com, you'll get the episodes there if you want them. You can join in the chat, we hope you do. One of our, our favourite things from the Columbo podcast was the engagement with our listeners, so we'd love to hear from you there. You can also get us on Twitter, at Sledgecast on Facebook again it's at Sledgecast and iTunes is the place to review and rate the show if you could, even if you don't listen on iTunes that's how the, the rankings for podcasts everywhere work and you'll help more and more people find the show which will be to their obvious benefit I think that's us for now, mm-hmm. so we'll, we'll see you next week Cheerio, bye <laughs>